The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. The sisters of Lazarus sent word to Jesus, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may, may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise. Martha said, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who was coming into the world. He became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now, many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kids are amazing, aren't they? They always say the craziest, beautiful things. Right before the 12 o'clock Spanish Mass, I was, as I customly do, I hang out in front of the church there, greeting our people as they come. This little girl, probably eight or nine years old, comes rushing up to me. Father, she starts pointing at the, this place here, right? She didn't know what the name of it was. His father, why are the statues covered? Right? She's looking. Why is it covered, father? And I, and I just, I, my heart just exploded with joy. I said, because yes, 
This, this is the purpose of this. It is to catch your attention. Because I hope when you walked in here, you said, hmm, something is different in our church. This is by design. We've entered now into what's called Passion Tide. And Passion Tide is always the fifth Sunday of Lent. And it is a time of year where we veil all of the images in the church. That's why when you walked in here in the vestibule, the image of Our Lady was covered. The image of Our Lady Guadalupe and the side altar here is covered. Statues, the crosses, even the processional cross, covered. The first time this is ever mentioned of this, this ancient Catholic practice dates back to the 9th century in Germany. So we've been doing this for a thousand years. And a little girl asked, why? It's to invoke a sense of absence. Absence. We cover up the images of faces to elicit the sense that something is missing. And that little girl picked that up. Why? When you come back next Sunday, we will enter the most important liturgical week in the entire Christian calendar. This will be the pinnacle of our worship. Everything that Jesus has ever done, his three years in active ministry, is leading up to this week. And we'll celebrate it on Palm Sunday. The palms already arrived. The UPS dropped them off just two days ago. <laughs> two huge boxes of palms will get ready. And we'll mimic what happened on Palm Sunday when Jesus triumphantly entered into the city of Jerusalem and the crowds, thousands of them, crowded the, the city gates to watch this Messiah process in. That crowd, when they grabbed the palm, they rejoiced and they sang hymns because they thought this Jesus would come in and conquer their greatest enemies and restore the kingdom. That's why they celebrated the triumph of Christ. But then we all know the story well, don't we? That same crowd which rejoiced Osana will take a dark turn. And they'll begin to yell, crucify him. Same crowd. Complete turn, 180. And our Lord will die. Absence. Emptiness. A void will come. So we veil the images. And so I hope this church feels a little empty. You know, this past week, it's, it's been a heavy week for our parish. We've had three funerals this, just this past week. The funeral we did here on Thursday, it was one of our parishioners. You, you probably haven't seen him because he has been bedridden for 20 years. 20 years. Oh, beautiful, his wife at his side for those 20 years. And then he eventually succumbed to his illness, 67. If you notice this about death, it creates that void, doesn't it? Think about this for a moment. Think to your greatest joy in your life. Your greatest moments, your happiest moments. I guarantee you the vast majority of you will say that it had to do something with relationship. Our greatest joys always tend to be in relation to somebody. Your wedding day, the birth of your child for the first time, 
the seeing of a lost long friend, the happy, simple moments of life, just hanging out in the backyard with the kids running around. If you notice it's about joy, it's always in relationship to somebody. And it's never about, oh, I bought a new car. Ah, that's not joy. I mean, it's fun for a week and then it gets old. <laughs> and conversely, think of your greatest pain in your life. It's always in, in relationship, a betrayal, a broken trust, a going away of a friend, a family member. Our greatest joys and our greatest defeats are always in relationship. And this dynamic is unfolding before our very eyes in this gospel. This gospel, by the way, is how we should handle that defeat. If you ever come to a moment like Martha here, pay attention to this gospel. Write it down on, in your heart, John chapter 11. Jesus receives word that his beloved friend Lazarus is ill. And then something strange happens here. So he hears the news that his friend is ill. Someone specifically says that he, whom he loves. And instead of reacting immediately, he says that he lingers for two days. This is utterly strange because anybody in here, if you, get, if you receive the call in the middle of the night saying, your loved one is sick and they might die. Every single one of us would drop whatever we're doing, we get out of bed, and we go immediately. Why? Love compels to us to. We go immediately and we rush to their side. But Jesus here, he lingers for two days. And so the question is why? When he finally gets to the city of Bethany, where this took place, he's greeted by Martha. Because it says here that Mary, the other sister, was so utterly heartbroken, she had no energy to leave the house. Oh, have we ever felt that? Have you ever had the breath knocked out of you, where you from grief, where you just you don't want to do anything, you just want to stay home? Mary is like that. Somehow Martha, the sister, has the energy to come out and meet our Lord. And then she asks a brilliant she has a brilliant statement here. It's utterly human. She sees Jesus, and he says to her, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. That's all of us. Anybody in here who has ever been devastated by illness or pain so utterly wrenching knows Martha's pain here. That parishioner of ours bedridden for 20 years. I guarantee you every single day cried out to God to heal him. Martha, same thing. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And so she has the pain, the universal pain of grief. What do we do with that pain? Because we're often tempted, aren't we? because of the suffering of God, because he does not answer our prayers in the way we think he should. But oftentimes people can immediately go to, well, then I will abandon the Lord. I will stop praying. Oh, that's a real temptation. To leave the Lord in our, in our darkest hour. Oh, it's a, it's a common temptation. But notice Martha now, why? Martha is the example here. Notice the next line after that utterly human statement. She says, oh, it's utterly beautiful. She says, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So in the midst of her pain, instead of running from the Lord, she says, Jesus, I know whatever you're going to do, God will answer your prayers. Her faith intensifies rather than fades. And from that moment, notice what happens next. 
Oh, everybody in vicinity of this conversation would have recognized it. He says, Martha, when our Lord says, your brother will rise, Martha responds, I know he will rise. And the resurrection on the last days is on future events. But Jesus says, no. Notice what happens next. I am the resurrection. Everybody in that crowd immediately would recognize what Jesus just said here. I am. He invokes the divine name revealed in Exodus 19. You remember when Moses asked God, what is your name, when he gave the Ten Commandments? And God says, Ehi, Asher, Ehi. I am who am. That phrase, the divine name, is not even uttered by our Jewish brothers and sisters because they utterly reverence that name. Jesus takes the divine name and now says, Ehi, Asher, Ehi. I am. God in the flesh. The drama continues. It's already getting better now. Watch this. He comes to the tomb of Lazarus, and there's a utterly strange detail that happens next. They go to Lazarus' tomb and they say, Jesus, don't open the tomb because he's been dead for four days. He's decomposing by this point, and it's not pretty. And when he comes to the tomb, it says here, and this, my friends, is the shortest scripture verse of the entire Bible. And I dare say it is its most profound. At the tomb of Lazarus, it says, and I quote, and Jesus wept. He wept. Why would he weep? He knows that he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. So why is he sad? Now, here is the beauty of the Christian faith. If you notice this about our suffering, when we suffer, we feel utterly alone. That's what happens in suffering. We feel utterly abandoned. God knows this about the human heart. And so what he does is Jesus enters into our suffering rather than immediately heal it. He enters into our pain with us. Because again, what is oftentimes whenever the suffering hits, I think that I'm down here, God's way up there. No, not the Christian worldview. Blessed are the brokenhearted. We hear that, remember, in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes? Because when we are brokenhearted is when Christ is closest to us. When anxiety hits, and here is the secret pill of Christianity, because there was no escaping grief. There was no, no escaping, no matter how hard we try, no matter how many vegetables we eat. So keep eating steak. Huh? It doesn't matter. We'll, we'll be hit. Sorry, Mom. Right? There's only one path of healing. And it is the presence of Jesus Christ. Period. Amen. It is only the presence of Jesus that truly heals. And so, if you are indeed suffering in any way, or in the future when that day finally comes, never forget this homily. It is Jesus Christ that will heal. Nothing else in this world can. Do you know what Bethany means in Aramaic? Bethany literally means the house of affliction. Jesus enters into our affliction. I am the resurrection and the life. 
Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Please, never forget that. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.